And thank you so much, Meg, for being with us today. Uh, I think it's a blessing. Uh, although we faced some obstacles, I think we can always try to find, um, uh, well, another route. And sometimes that's exactly the route God wants us to go through. So I prayed to Carla Kutis today because I'm not very good with technology. I'm not an IT guy at all. So I think it was one of my first prayers to Carla Kutis, although he's been in my life for some time now, especially through art. But I today I said, oh, my God, Carlo, you were so good. You are a geek for computers. Please give me and Meg a hand. And I think he did because I just got the green light that this is working on Facebook. So that's our first miracle tonight. <laughs> so without any further ado, uh, let's let's start. Um, thank you, everyone that is joining us. Um, it's it's a true pleasure for me to be here uh, with with Meg. Uh, through social media, I understood that the church um, exists and it's a different kind of community that we are used to or we were used to. We, be, we become brothers and sisters of people that we only know virtually. And when Meg was, um, Meg wrote a book and I'm going to speak about it in just in a minute. I was so fascinated by the stories that she was writing about the saints. I felt so inspired that I started painting a lot of the saints that Meg speaks in her book. Uh, so yes, thank you, Mac, for all the work you are giving me. But <laughs> I really appreciate that. My and goodness, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and one day, Mac said, "Well, listen, I'm going to London. Should we do something together?" Say yes, please. <laughs> so that's how we are here together. Providence really brought us together, although virtually. But we are still closer than if Mac was in the United States. But always close in Christ. So we became friends. So thank you for your friendship. Thank you for being here uh, tonight. So for me, I'm Ruben and I'm a sacred art artist for people that are seeing me for the first time. I know, Meg, that you have a lot of fans that are joining us tonight. So for those that don't, don't know me, uh, I'm a Catholic artist and I devote my time painting and I like to bring humanity, good humor, um, uh, proximity with sacred art. I believe that sacred art needs to be a place of encounter and encounter for everyone. Uh, and Meg, uh, Meg is, um, is an author, a very famous author as well. She writes uh, a book that we are going to speak tonight. Uh, she wrote this book. Let me see if I can show it. Uh, pray, uh, pray for us. Uh, I got to know this book through the Allo app. It's also an amazing app, a Catholic app for meditation and reflections and all that. And uh, one of the, some of the stories, I believe it's seven or eight stories, uh, Meg, I'm not sure, were taken from this book and I started listening. As I was listening, I felt so compelled, so compelled to know more about the sign, so I had to buy the book. And it's a very good sign that the book was sold out for a couple of the couple last weeks. I was trying to buy books for people in the parish and it was difficult, but now I have it. I have, I have two books already. One is for my nephew, don't tell him. Uh, <laughs> so yes, so Meg is a, is a famous author. She's also a missionary. She does a lot of inspirational talks. Uh, she helps us to uh, stretch our preconceived notions of holiness and explore the lesser known lives of extra extraordinary people whose human struggles and limitations reveal the power of God and grace. And this has been for me a great inspiration to bring those stories to life uh, through painting. Uh, Meg, I'm, I'm going to allow you to say something before I start telling the story of my life with the saints. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to allow you to, <laughs> to say hello to everyone as well, because I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> well, friends, it's just such a gift to be chatting with you, um, and especially even if still remotely to be talking with you, Ruben. Um, I think you know, I uh, I come from a heritage of artists. My great grandfather was a painter, and so I, I grew up surrounded by beautiful art outside of a Catholic context. Mm -hmm. um, but in a Catholic context in America, maybe less so, right? We have this great heritage of beautiful Catholic art that we've sort of lost touch with over recent decades. And I think especially the way that we've depicted the saints from centuries has been rather sterile. Um, and certainly in recent years has also been just poorly executed, right? It's not just that they seem like these, these plaster images that are so far away, but also it's sort of embarrassing to look at this art and be like, oh, this is, 
this is what it is to be a Catholic artist. Um, and so I've just been so grateful to see these artists who are coming up who have a real artistic sensibility, who have a sense of the humanity of the saints, who are willing to show the saints and these characters from scripture in ways that reflect this, this three dimensionality, right? That show them as real authentic people. You can have a relationship that show their brokenness, that show their struggle. Um, and that's so much of the work that I'm trying to do in my writing. And so Ruben, to see the images that you're coming up with, especially for the saints that we don't have pictures of, right? Like, like until you drew blessed Peter Kasuiki Bay, there's <laughs> one photograph of one statue of him in the world. Yes. Like that, that's, and like Lindsay drew our picture in Saints Around the World, which is beautiful, but it's not like a thing you're going to put up in a church, right? It's a children's picture. And so to have these images now of these saints who mean so much to me, who I just haven't been able to share with people in the same way, has been such a gift. So I'm so glad for this collaboration. I think it's a great blessing. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Meg. It's really, really my pleasure. Um, well, as you said, you said uh, that you didn't, you, you were you were not raised in a Catholic context, is that right? You were not uh, raised, raised as, a, as a Catholic? I was raised Catholic, um, yeah, in sort of the way that people raised their kids Catholic in the 80s, you know, we're like, <laughs> we went to church in our asymmetrical brown brick monstrosity of a church with our, uh, you know, golden ascending Jesus in front of a plexiglass cross. Uh, so, yeah, certainly not in the sense of being surrounded by the richness of the church's uh, liturgical mm -hmm. or artistic tradition. Mm, yes, <laughs> so I I can resonate with that in a in a way. Um, so just just yeah to give a context as well how I uh, how am I here as an, a Catholic artist? I I was baptized. Okay, that that's that was it. Uh, that was my my path <laughs> uh, that my parents did with me uh, because they were. It's what we in Portugal we call the non-practicing Catholics. So it's Catholic by tradition. Um, so, okay, I was baptized, checked that box, um, and then nothing else. So I remember not having a lot of contact with the Catholic Church at all. I didn't even know what a Mass was. I remember seeing images of the Pope on television, uh, but nothing that we would pay much attention. Uh, if much, we would we, we, we will do the usual critics to the Church that we often you, uh, hear from people that are not from the Church. Um, so that was the way I was brought up, not engaging with the Church at all. And I remember being a teenager, and people that have heard me in, the, in different talks, they, they are fed up of hearing this story, but <laughs> it's always part of my path, so I have to say, I have to share. Um, I, I was a teenager, and uh, with nothing to do, uh, no TikToks then, uh, no, uh, no Instagram, nothing of social media, and I'm realizing I'm getting old. Uh, <laughs> I was just zapping. And um, uh, a film was about to start, and it was a film about Mother Teresa, so, fine i didn't know what what it was anyway but was about to start so i thought that let me watch it uh, by the end of it i think i was struck by the example of this woman um how could she devote her life in the name of this christ that i didn't know to the poorest of the poor um i think that was the first entrance um that was the first door that got open in my heart to come in um I, usually some people go and try to search God. I believe that God came and searched for me <laughs> and he was very creative. Well, God is the artist, he's the ultimate artist. So no, no matter, no, doesn't, well, doesn't surprise me that he was that creative uh, to get into my life. Um, and then I started to have more curiosity. Being an artist was already something that I was good at school. Uh, so art and being a person for me was already becoming a reality. Um, and, and I started adding the spiritual part of it because through art in Portugal, and I'm original from Portugal, and sorry if I do any grammar mistakes, <laughs> English is not my first language. So yes, apologies in advance. Uh, but in Portugal, in Lisbon, um, we do have beautiful churches, uh, beautiful heritage. Uh, so when you visit the churches, and I was visiting them out of curiosity, art wise but again with that unsettled in the heart for something more and i started seeing pictures of the saints paintings of the saints um and i started wondering why are these people losing their heads why is this guy full of spears through his body oh my god why are they losing their heads for christ literally <laughs> what is happening so through the lives of saints i um 
I get to, I got to know Jesus and establish a re personal relationship with him. And it's important for us to say that the saints don't replace that unique relationship with Jesus. Uh, they guide us to him. And that, that's what they did in my life. And they keep doing it. I don't know if you feel the same, Meg, but when we enter a relationship with the saints, they come and go according to what we need in certain times. So I feel that sometimes I re am really close to a certain person, certain friend in heaven, but in another time I will be closer to another. And that's how it works with our friends on earth as well, isn't it? Sometimes we are more closer to ones and others. Uh, and I think that's how God shows his love and compassion towards us. And you have used this comparison and I use it as well. It's like going on a race. Uh, I would, you would never find me on a race because I hate sports, but <laughs> no way. I always say my body doesn't sweat. My body cries when I have to do sports. Uh, but if you ever found me in a race or if you imagine yourself in a race, uh, the saints will be the ones cheering up for us to reach that goal. They are the ones clapping. They are the ones go, go, go. And if we fall, they will be the ones lifting us up and say, carry on. You can, you can continue. They are not the goal, uh, but they will be on the way to encourage us to go further and further. Uh, so this is how I got um, to your book, because reading about the saints, um, it's something that it's part of my spiritual journey, it's part, part of my spiritual life, part of my inspiration, uh, part of me seeing myself as an artist. Um, when I paint, I always tell people it's not... Um, it's I, I don't paint alone for me painting is a relationship painting for me it's praying so as i was reading your book um it happens that, oh my god this this person is amazing i have to paint her or i have to paint him because it's my way to communicate with them to feel that i'm in touch with the divine it's like being here in my studio it's like this becomes my my cell in my monastery you know this is a place of prayer pray, pray, place of contemplation a place where sometimes i feel i touch the divine then it's difficult to go back to the reality uh and the most amazing part is that i'm no i'm not a special person <laughs> you know? so sometimes and god still uses me as he uses everyone to do great things in the world uh, because i come to my studio often and i'm just looking at the paintings and i say oh my god I don't even know where this came from, you know? It's that feeling that art is far and beyond who I am as a person. And when we open our heart to the creative spirit, uh, to the Holy Spirit, to the, to, 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 to the inspiration that comes from God, things happen and beautiful things happen, like our relationship, like uh, paintings, like, you know, things that weren't there before. And suddenly they are coming up, they are appearing, they are making a journey. So from reading your book, seeing all these saints that, as you say, uh, sinned, suffered and struggled on their way to holiness, I felt really close to them. And they, and it, they are still a very big source of inspiration. And I couldn't prevent myself from painting a few of them. Um, and you show saints from, and I'm almost finishing, handing over to you again, because I need to give people a break from my voice. <laughs> and it was your book and coming to London, that start showing to me the diversity that we see in the churches. I recently moved to a community and different parish where we were meant to do this event live, um, live no, no, in person. And the community is very diverse. When I look around, I see people from Asia, I see people from South America, I see people from America, I see people from Africa, from Europe, Central Europe, Western Europe, everywhere in the globe, I see people in the church. Someone told me, the parish priest told me that the church, the Catholic church in, in London is like the tube or the subway. Uh, it's as diverse as you find people in the tube or the subway. Um, and I start wondering, these people are not represented in sacred art. Uh, when we look at paint panels or stained glasses or statues, um, where are these people? You know, and the same in literature, uh, same when we speak about this, the lives of the saints, sometimes they are underrepresented. That's why I believe your book opens our perspective to the church being universal. You mentioned Kibe. I was painting Kibe and he appears with the, the flag of Japan in the background. 
I had a friend coming over to visit us, and he looked at the painting. Oh, who is it? Who is that guy? I said, "Well, it's blessed Peter Kasuikibe, a Japanese saint." And he said, "Oh, I didn't know that we had Japanese saints." So, how? Yeah, you know, people sometimes think that saints are only European, uh, white and blonde and pure and ca- and chaste and nothing else. Uh, that's why most people don't feel close to the saints because they don't feel like real people that you can really connect to. And this said, <laughs> I hand over to you so you can speak a little bit more uh, how you feel about the saints, what special place they have in your life as well. And to yeah, if you want to, to start telling us a story or two about the saints, it will be even better. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Ruben, it's beautiful to hear you talk about the way that the saints brought you to Jesus. That's not at all my experience. Uh, so I... I met Jesus when I was 13 years old and I was like, let's go, right? Like, I don't do things halfway. If Jesus is God, like, I'm going to win church, right? Um, And I, from the beginning, really had a profound sense of personal relationship with Jesus, right? There was always, there was always an intimacy. There was always a friendship. There was pretty soon, there was this, a real deep bridal relationship with Jesus, which is beautiful to talk about on the Feast of St. John of the Cross, because that's like, (laughs) <laughs> so much the heart of St. John of the Cross is his understanding of himself as bride of Jesus, the bridegroom. Mm-hmm. Um, but the saints were something, the way that I heard them talked about, when people cared about them, it was very much like, oh, well, I go to St. Rita when I can't go to Jesus. And I was like, that's <laughs> not a thing I'm comfortable accepting, right? Or or they would tell these stories and they weren't stories. It's just a list of facts with mm-hmm. no narrative thrust and no personality and any struggles are whitewashed out like jerome was allowed to be angry and everybody else was like absolutely immaculate pristine placid and bland right like there's no there's no passion there there's no personality there um and it was so much what i saw in artwork as well right just like saint therese gazing into space right very <laughs> ah, approach to holiness and like that's just not saint therese like you get to know saint therese this girl is a spitfire right um but this was always the way that the saint stories were told and so i you know i like looked in the into the apologetics angle and was like well this is not idolatry and so you know give it the meg hunter kilmer seal of approval and like set it to the side as something that is not my personal spirituality which mm-hmm. is just so funny like given who i am now um, and then years and years later, I heard the stories of the saints told well. I read a book by Ann Ball called Modern mm-hmm. Saints. She's fantastic. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. So first of all, these stories can be interesting, which if nothing else, you know, it accomplishes sort of what you experienced, right? Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. wanted to see the artwork and then you were intrigued by the saints and that drew you to Jesus, right? I can tell these stories to people who don't want to hear me talk about the Bible. Mm -hmm, They mm -hmm. don't want to hear me explain Catholic apologetics. But if I'm like, oh, hey, here's this saint who walked 3,700 miles because everybody was super racist and wouldn't ordain him a priest. People are like, there's a what now? And I'm like, oh, do you want to? Sure, cool. You know, like people want to hear the stories, right? And so I started to look into the stories because I was like, this is a great way to testify. And then I began to realize just how different they were and how they were speaking to every wound in people's hearts, you know, as a, as an evangelist. And I've been a a full-time missionary for 10 and a half years. I was a teacher for five years before that, a religion Mm -hmm. teacher. Um, So I have spent the entirety of my adult life trying to tell people how much God loves them. And the most important moment when you're doing that work is when you can name the element of somebody's life that they think makes them ineligible for the love of God and yeah. claim that as a lie. Yeah. And when you can do that by holding up someone the church has put a halo on, it's like next level, right? Because if I say, no, 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 like Jesus loves you in the midst of your divorce, you're like, you're just saying that. And yeah. if I'm like, no, 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 here's a canonized saint who was divorced, you're like, oh. Okay, so this is not just like you trying to make me feel feelings. This is like dogma, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and to see that with saints who lived with addiction or saints who survived clerical sexual abuse or saints who experienced mental illness or saints who were misfits, who just never felt like they belonged in the yeah. church. And to be able to share that story with people again and again has just been, 
it's been such a gift to me uh, to witness the way that the saints have this deep love for us. They want to have a relationship with us. Um, and I think that, you know, it, you're talking about the way that in your art, there are things that come out that you know are not from you. And I think for me, it's the same thing when I'm speaking, either when I'm standing at a podium giving a talk or when I'm talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, there are words that come out of my mouth where I'm like, stop, can we write this down? Because, <laughs> because I know that's not me, right? Like I know like that phrasing isn't something that I would naturally say, or that's, that's not a concept I've thought about before. Um, and to see the way that, that the storytelling draws people into the heart of Jesus and helps them to know how wildly they're loved. I mean, it's, it's just such a gift. And I think you've probably had the same experience of like, you had all of these different elements of your personality and your gifts and these idiosyncrasies. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know, like, how does this all fit together? Right? Like, what is the Lord doing with all of this? And I think for me, you know, I've always been a storyteller. I just never really had worthwhile stories to tell. So I just told worthless stories, right? Because I, like, I, like right? <laughs> so I, like, I, I can't help but tell a story, right? And so I'm just going to tell a story about something that happened at the grocery store that isn't that interesting, like, because I, yeah. I can't help myself. Same. And, <laughs> and it wasn't until I started learning about the saints that I was like, oh, this is what that gift was for. And I had yeah. this like bizarre memory for personal details. And so for many years, I just used that to like, awkwardly bring up things that I knew about people from 15 years ago. And they would be like, oh, why do you remember that? And I'd be like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. And then with the saints, I'm like, oh, this is why I have that memory. Right. And um, like my travel all over the world, that's what the Lord was doing there. And my encountering people and, that, and having like this charism that causes people to dump on me I was like, oh, it, it's so that the Lord would teach me about the brokenness of his people so that I would be looking for that brokenness in the saints so that I could bring that brokenness to light and show people what God is doing through their suffering as well. Uh, and so it's just been really tremendous to see the way that the Lord was laying that groundwork and that foundation um, and such a gift to be able to see so much of the fruit of telling these stories. Um, so we thought that we would tell you guys a couple of stories of some of the saints that Ruben has painted, um, and then maybe see where we go from there. I have I've got to start with Sarah Shalkahazi because you've got that <laughs> picture behind her, and I just Ruben, I can't with her with her Let beautiful me, face. I can show her. Uh, it's amazing how you mentioned storytelling. That's what Jesus was doing, isn't it? And you are mm -hmm. just doing the same. Uh, and this brings us back to joy. And we are both here speaking with smiles in our faces because some people believe that. You have to be very serious when it's about God, when you speak about God, especially in Portugal and Spain and Italy. It's a very serious tradition, you know. We even have a saying that says that if you smile a lot, it means that you are not a serious person. And as you can tell, I'm, I'm a little bit of a goof, you know. I just like to, to, to play around and tell jokes and stories as well, trying to be funny. Uh, and I thought I had to be serious uh, all the time. But then, and I know that Teresa of Avila had a place in your heart as well. I met Teresa of Avila. I've been in Avila several times. Um, uh, and uh, she says that she was more afraid of a sad nun than a herd of evil spirits. I said, so, okay, <laughs> so I can be I can be funny because Teresa has my back. Uh, but let's now go to Sarah. Sarah, it's, it's an amazing character. So yeah, here we, we, here we have Sarah. Um, yes, so Betty, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, but it was just to add that. No, not at all. And I think it's the joy that makes this painting so stunning to me, right? That you can see in her eyes you know, and and they've she's got these Nazi soldiers. We'll tell the story in just a minute. She's got these Nazi soldiers grabbing her, and there's so much anger. And even like her clothes are in a state of disarray, but her face just pointing straight on towards the viewer with not just a look of serenity, but but a look of eager anticipation. Right? This isn't like and and I totally value that people are afraid of death. That's like a, a really reasonable thing to fear, and you're not less holy because the idea of being martyred terrifies you like that's okay but for her in this moment she was like this is what i've been living for this is who i've been moving towards like i get to see my jesus right and so like whatever it takes however you guys have to do it um but sarah's a really beautiful case so she's a hungarian woman um i guess she, she's slovakian but she's living in hungary um and she grew up with 
a you know a, a pretty reasonable amount of privilege um and she was a she was a tomboy and she was really um she was loud and outgoing and so you know there's a lot of things about sarah that i'm like this mm -hmm. is my girl right uh, she's a socialist she's a chain smoker like some things i don't necessarily identify with yes. um, <laughs> but she was she was just a lot right and she's doing this great work for the poor she was working as a journalist and then she's working like in like as a bookbinder, like down in the mess with the working class, as a woman of privilege who didn't have to be doing that. And then a friend of hers was going to a meeting with the Sisters of Social Service. And Sarah was like, yeah, I'll come along, like whatever, no big deal. And she shows up at this meeting and she was like, oh shoot, this is what I was made for. This is what I was made for. And she asked the sisters if, they, if she could enter and they were like, ooh, I don't. I don't know about you, right? They, she had to quit smoking. She had to like get herself together. And so she did. Um, and eventually it took her a year to quit smoking. So if you're dealing with addiction or if you're just like having a hard time quitting smoking and it's like maybe not at the level of addiction yet, like she's a good friend for that. But she managed she to said, quit. She said it was one of the most difficult things she had to do for Jesus was actually yeah. quit, quitting smoking. It was difficult for her. Yeah. <laughs> right. And as you see from the picture, like she did not have an easy life. Right. Um, but the smoking was a big part of of what the struggle was. Uh, she was able to enter eventually and and still she just didn't quite fit. You know, like she was she was too loud. She was too intense. We've got this beautiful prayer she wrote and I'll, I'll read it from the book. Um, yes, please, please, this yes. was the reason I read this prayer and I was like, this is my girl. Look, I love yeah. I love her. Same. She Same. says. I am short tempered, vehement, nervous and passionate, but still I love you. I am disobedient, stubborn, and defiant, but I love you. I am restless, hasty, and confused, but I love you. I am dark, envious, and making comparison, but I love you. And this is, she wrote this prayer around the time that she was told she had to stop wearing the habit of the Sisters of Social Service, right? Like this profound rejection from the heart of the church of these women who she'd tried to give her life to be part of. And they were like, we just don't want people to look at you and think of us right like it's just because of her personality and she turns to the lord and then she's like look maybe i'm not who i should be but i love you i love you and in the midst of that there's there's some real self-reflection where she's like okay these parts of me do need to be purified but there's no sense that she had to stop being herself and i think so often that's our experience of reading the lives of the saints is we're like oh well all of the saints were this way and so I have to mash myself into that mold. I have to like shave off these bits of my personality so I can fit in this mold. And it's just not Catholic, right? It's yeah. not it's not an authentic view of who the saints are. It's not a, a composite view of all of these saints that we have throughout history. It's a very 20th, 21st century Western image of holiness that requires people to form themselves to be exactly the same as each other, right? This like instagram catholicism where like in order to be a holy catholic woman your children all have to be dressed in the same shades right <laughs> these like monochromatic portraits with your chickens and your sourdough and your liturgical cupcakes and like if that's who you are i love that for you like i love that for you uh, but if that's we're really, holy really yeah it's really true and it can damage through vocations you know uh, you say something that really stick to me. You said that there is nothing in ourselves that God won't use for our holiness. And that stayed with me. And I keep telling that to people all the time. And that's so true. Uh, I, I, I was in a journey as well. At a certain point in my life, I felt I had to copy the saints and I had to be exactly like them. Unfortunately, then I didn't see any funny saints. So I, again, back to what I felt I had to be serious, you know, uh, discreet and all that. And uh, even feeling bad for not following uh, a, a consecrated life. I never felt the calling. I did the discernment. I never felt the calling to priesthood. But I ran, ended up realizing the gifts in the church are so diverse. Why should we always try or why should we think that we have to follow only one path? Because that's that's castrating, that's cutting, that's bearing gifts that God is putting in our hearts. Um, so yes, we it's not about copying them. Uh, my spiritual director he, he says uh, we will only be true saints if we are truly ourselves and ourselves as a whole, not hiding parts in our lives that we think that God won't like or no. Bring God to that part of your life as well. Do you like to go to disco at night and have a few drinks? 
take God with you. Don't cut him off your life. Don't put God in a box, a box that you just tick when you go to mass, if you go to mass, you know, or when you pray when someone is really in trouble or when you are really in trouble. Don't put God in a box. Allow him to transform your whole life because he doesn't shy away from people. He doesn't shy away from us. And that's all about Christmas, isn't it? But again, I'll go. <laughs> exactly. And Sarah totally understood this. You know, Sister Sarah, she she persevered. She hung on to who she was while also pursuing the life that God was calling her to. Ultimately, she took vows with the sisters, and she's just this incredible woman. I mean, she's an author and a playwright, and she started a, a um, Catholic women's college and uh, ran a bookstore and all these charitable works, and then eventually the Nazis came to power. And this woman was not like a bow your head and take it kind of a person. She actually changed her name. Uh, her last name was Schalkaz, which was a, a Germanified version and she mm -hmm. changed her name to Shalkahazi, which was the more Croatian one, so, or um, sorry, Slovakian one, mm -hmm. just to needle the Nazis, right? She was like, yeah. oh, oh, you think the Germans are the best? I'm gonna be even less German. Like, watch <laughs> me be less German now. Um, and ultimately started hiding Jews, saved yeah. the lives of a hundred Jewish people. She was awarded um, a, she are declared righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. She taught her sisters how to save 900 more lives. And all because she had continued to be the person that she always was. She hadn't tried to shrink. She hadn't tried to hide. And being the person that God made her to be made it possible for her to be this great hero. And ultimately, uh, she was betrayed by one of the people that uh, that she was helping to care for. And she was arrested by the Nazis. And she saw the Nazis at the door. Right. She was like across the piazza. She saw the Nazis and the sister she was with was like, Sister Sarah, let's go. And she was like, no, if they're coming for my people, they're coming for me. And and she went right up to them um, and was murdered by the Nazis. But here's this woman who could have spent her life trying to shrink. She could have spent her life trying to fade. She could have spent her life trying to fit into other people's molds. Uh, but she had this profound sense that God made her good. And that yeah. she needed to be the person that he made her to be and not not some false image of holiness that she had absorbed from some two dimensional, uh, you know, one of one of those like pink cheeked, rosy eyed uh, yeah. images of holiness that we see all over the place. And she was like, no, like God made me on purpose. Yes, that's so true. And when I read the story, I thought, oh, my God, this I can relate to this woman. Uh, I felt that I was pushed in the church because I was not fitting the mold. So I do relate with her. And, you know, uh, the creative spirit is when I'm starting, um, this is like, well, let's speak about COVID. It's like COVID, it's highly <laughs> transmissible. So when you, when you are captivated by the saints and feeling so inspired by it, you contaminate me as well. So I cannot prevent it. We are not, that is, there are no masks for this. <laughs> you, you speak so passionately about the saints that there is no way I won't absorb all that and start painting an image in my in my in my head so i often tell my close friends that i have hundreds of paintings in my heart and sometimes i i go through some stressful moments where i feel overwhelmed with the amount of paintings i have in my mind that already exist but i haven't put them outside yet and i'm kind of oh my god i have to do this before i die <laughs> Otherwise, people won't see it uh, because I know it. they generate a conversation. I painted Sarah and I never expected, as I painted other, paint, other saints that we can speak about, uh, I never expected the conversation, the dialogue, the, 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 the reaction that they generate. And this really shows that it goes beyond ourselves, that art and literature and the way you write, the way you tell stories, it goes far and beyond ourselves and our own limitations. This painting I did of Sarah... Um, I just wanted to capture the last moment of her when she when she was about to go to be arrested. She said, let me go and pray and correct me if I'm wrong. She went to the chapel to pray for a moment. And then the soldiers came and lifted her up and dragged her out. Uh, and the, I think the soldier told her, you can pray after or something like that. Mm -hmm. But one of the sisters that were in the chapel saw her face feeling like, she knew what she was going through and she felt that holiness from Sarah, you know, and everyone describes Sarah as being a, a, a joyous, a joyful person, always with a smile in her face. There was no way I could 
portrayed her in a different way than with a smile, because this is how Sarah always looked. But I wanted to capture the moment that he was the, the contrast between hate and love. They are even trying to push her away from the canvas, you know, like she had no place to be there, no place to be seen by us because they wanted to kill her and end Sarah. But God had other plans, you know, so she's there. It seems that they are even struggling to move her because she was very, she's a strong person, a strong figure. Uh, and uh, that's what I wanted to portray, the reaction, the contrast between evil and good uh, and how, how, how she stood up. Um, you know, with her joy, with the certainty that she was doing God's will. And we could spend the whole night speaking just about her, you know. <laughs> we could, but let's move to Peter Kiwe. Yes. This is the one I think that I'm like most excited that you've drawn just because for years I've told his story and I'm just like, here's a photograph of a statue in <laughs> Japan and that's the best I can do. And I love sharing the images of the saints with people. And, you know, there's approximations of all kinds of them, but, mm -hmm. but, but I didn't have Kibe until this one. And he's one of my very, very best friends. So he's a Japanese man. He was born to a Christian family and a Christian samurai family in Japan in 1587. And he grew up going to Jesuit schools and he knew that God was calling him to be a Jesuit priest. And so he went to the Jesuits after he graduated from high school and he was like, will you ordain me? And they were like, oh, we are not sure if you're committed enough. So he was like, okay, right, fine. Um, so he makes a vow that he will be ordained a Jesuit priest. And then he volunteers with them for eight years. And he keeps going back and they keep putting him off. They keep putting him off. Finally, 1614, all uh, Western missionaries in Japan are kicked out of the country. And Kibe's like, cool, I will get my stuff. And the other Jesuits are like, Nobody, like only the Western missionaries have to leave your Japanese. And he was like, right. Is there somebody here who's going to ordain me? Yeah. No. Okay. I'll get my stuff. So he goes with them to Portuguese Macau, which is in China. Mm -hmm. And he goes to seminary there and they say, we don't ordain Japanese people. Yeah, which because like, the, Port the Portuguese had um, extremely important business with Japan yeah. back then. So this was all politics. They didn't want to interfere with that. That's right. why I said, no, we don't want to get in trouble with that. So, yes. Exactly. And so you're like, you know, this for this one, I can like maybe see that this is like just a political issue. Like the Shogun has just kicked everybody out. I'm like, what's it going to do if we make waves in this way? But he's like, okay, all right, fine. I'll go to Goa, right? So he goes to Goa. There's a seminary there that was founded by St. Francis Xavier mm -hmm. for the purpose of forming native clergy. Because when they first got to India, everybody had been so racist that they were like, oh, if you're going to be a priest... You have to eat like Europeans eat and you have to sleep like Europeans sleep and you have to dress like Europeans dress. And it was there was this great loss of vocation because of this cultural supremacy. And so Francis Xavier had been like, no, absolutely not. We're not forming Spaniards. We're yeah. we're not forming Portuguese men. We're forming priests. Right. So he built a seminary. Kibe goes to the seminary is like, will you ordain me? And they had just fallen so far from when Francis Xavier had been there that they were like, actually, we don't ordain anyone Asian at all. Like in India, we're not ordaining even Indian men, right? Like they were they were just too racist. And he could so easily have been like, you know what? First of all, I tried, right? Like God can't hold this against me. But but second of all, like I don't need to be part of a church that's going to treat me like this, right? And so many people in our world today have had that experience of racism at the hands of the church, like in the name of Jesus, right? People saying yeah. horrific things doing yeah. horrific things, claiming that there's no such thing as racism anymore. Um, yeah. And it's it's a totally reasonable thing to walk away. But it's such a gift to have a saint friend who's like, I get that. I get that. But this is your church just as much as it is their church. And he is your God just as much as he is their God. And Jesus does not look at you and see you as flawed. He delights in your race. He delights in your culture. He delights in every aspect of you. And so Kibe keeps going. Right. He's he's like, all right, fine. I'll go to Rome. And I guess he was sick of boats because he decided that he would walk there. Yeah. <laughs> so and this is the this is the thing that really got me when I first got to know uh, Peter Kibe in 2017. It was right before I went to Japan and right after Martin Scorsese's film Silence came yes. out. So it was like yes. the perfect storm for me to become best yes. friends with this guy. <laughs> um, he decides he'd walk there. And so he walks all the way to Jerusalem. That's thirty seven hundred miles. 
right? I feel like I deserve a halo when I walk up half a flight of steps to get to church, right? And this guy, 3,700 miles. So he's just like, I love a good pity party. And he's just, he destroys every pity party, you know? Cause you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself. And he's like, I walked 3,700 miles and I need you to get it together. And you're like, okay, yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair point. So he becomes the first Japanese person ever to enter Jerusalem, goes to Rome, gets ordained in Rome. And he's like, all right, send me back. And they were like, ooh, oh, they're killing Christians in Japan. And he was like, yeah. And they're like, no, we don't think you understand. They're like hanging them upside down, sealed in pits of human waste and human remains. They're hanging them on crosses at the edge of the ocean, letting the tide come in and drown them. They're killing Christians. And he was like, yeah, send me back. They were like, okay. So, you know, he's a Jesuit at this point and he, uh, he gets his orders to Japan and it take, he sails to Madagascar and he winters in Madagascar and he sails to Goa. It takes him 18 months to get to Goa. If it takes me 18 months to get somewhere, I would be like, I live here now. Yeah. I like <laughs> curry. We're fine. So, and and you, like, know, uh, you know, it was funny how I, uh, well, I felt fascin fascinated by him, by his story. It's amazing. He became, because of you, he became one of my, uh, art patrons uh, alongside with Therese of Lisieux because I need some of determination as well. So I thought, okay, Kibi is my man. <laughs> I need him. And I felt so close to him, uh, to his story, even historically. So when he leaves Rome, uh, he's an ordained uh, priest and they allow him to do his vows as a Jesuit on his way back to Japan. Back then, the way back uh, to Japan was through Lisbon. Uh, so Peter goes, Peter Kibe goes to Lisbon and in there he does his vows as a Jesuit. I'm from Lisbon. I said, oh my God, I cannot believe that now I have something in common with Kibe. I only found this out after I read the story and made him my patron for the art. You know, how amazing is this? It's like having something in common with a celebrity. And <laughs> I, I know which church is and I will send you a photo one of these days when I go there. But yeah, yes. sorry, then to go to Macau uh, and then to Goa as well. And yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so so then from Goa, he sails to Macau and he's like, can I get a ship to Japan? And they're like, we don't send Christians to Japan. And he's like, I know, I know. Like, set me on fire, boil me alive, whatever. And they're like, no, we don't send Christians to Japan because if we send Christians to Japan, they send warships back. So he's like, okay, so it's two years trying to get a ship, can't do it. Sails to Siam, to Thailand. Sailing out of the harbor, chased by pirates back into the harbor, stopped by the Port Authority, two years, can't get a ship. So he's like, all right, fine. I'm going to the Philippines, right? Y'all know how to Catholic. Anybody is going to help me out. It's the Philippines. And he gets to the Philippines. And they're like, we don't send Christians. And he was like, fine, you know what, whatever. I've got a hammer. I will build a boat, right? And so this is one of those things, like we, he and I definitely have this determination in common, right? Yeah. Um, but his, my determination usually just leads me to feel miserable about the things that aren't happening as opposed to like actually working hard to make them happen, right? So yeah. he like kind of pushes me over that hump a little bit. So he builds himself a ship to sail across a thousand miles of Pacific Ocean. They inspect the ship before they board. They discover it's been eaten by termites. He was like, just stick your fingers in the holes. Like, we are getting on the boat. So they get on this ship. They're sailing. They're within sight of Japan. And they're shipwrecked by a typhoon. And you're like, oh, are you kidding me? Kibe borrows a fishing boat to row himself the rest of the way to Japan. It took him eight years to get from Portugal to Japan. It took him 24 years from when he first asked to be a Jesuit priest in Japan until he finally made it back there as a priest of Jesus Christ, all the while knowing he was on his way to torture and certain death. He never gave up. And he lived for nine years undercover, bringing people the sacraments, moving only under cover of darkness. And people would come, they would hike for days through monsoon season in the mountains, but they would come because they knew that the Eucharist is at the heart of everything that we are as Catholics because they would rather die than live without confession. And he's one of the only priests in Japan at the time. He's certainly got the longest lasting ministry at that time. He worked for nine years and eventually he was, he was betrayed and he was arrested and into his cell walks Liam Neeson's character from Martin Scorsese's film Silence. Yeah. And that Neeson plays Father Ferreira, who is a Portuguese Jesuit priest who had denied the faith and started working for the Japanese government to destroy the faith of Christians. And I love this moment. He looks at Kibe and he starts arguing, right? He starts coming up with all of these, as they say, Jesuitical arguments against the faith. And Kibe just looks at him and is like, come with me. 
And Pharaoh's like, what? And Kibe says, let me hear your confession. And then come and die with me for the glory of Jesus Christ. That in this moment, when he sees this great traitor to everything he believes in, Kibe's like, brother, you can be a saint. Right? Let, let's be saints together. Like, this is his heart for the gospel. That he, he, never, he never rates anybody off. He never sees anybody as unsavable. Um, and Ferreira, God rest his soul, said no. He backs out. Kibe gets tortured for 10 days. Finally, they cut him down. They said, this is a man who will never say, I give up. And I'm just, you know, I, I tell this story. And at first when I would tell the story, people were like, oh, they're fascinated. They're fascinated. Like, just because it's a really cool story. And all of a sudden I was like, wait, but the reason that it's cool is not that he did all of this wild traveling back in the day and he was so brave and there were shipwrecks and whatever. The reason that it's cool is that he was motivated not by an ideology, not by a theory, not by a profession, any of those things. You live a life like that for an ideology and you're a fanatic. You're a lunatic, right? If you travel like that because you really want people to know about algebra, like you, you're in need of great help, right? This kind of life only makes sense if it's a love affair. It only makes sense if, is, if your motivation is that you are a man in love. And Kibe's whole life was motivated by this, this wild and passionate love of Jesus. And it doesn't manifest itself in the poetic musings of John of the Cross, right? Like for him to be a man in love meant the faithfulness and the perseverance. Um, and so he's, I mean, I, I just love, I love this image. I love the Japanese flag in the image when you put that in, you know, cause you were like sharing on Instagram and I'm like seeing yeah. things happen when you put that in. I was like, get it, Ruben. Uh, <laughs> I was just glad that the only thing I had in common with this story was not the same surname as the Father Ferreira because we have the same surname. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not related to the torturer, I think. <laughs> At least not, not from the recent generations. Uh, but yeah, so I was really glad um, that our our paths cross in Lisbon for other reasons rather than our the, than the surname in the story. But yeah, Kibe is such a fascinating figure. Uh, and you spoke about people suffering discrimination in the church. Um, and again, all this, reading your book and the new community, the new parish community I met, uh, looking at these people and wondering where they are not represented in sacred art, made me uh, aware that they need a, we all need a place. Jesus, if, if one thing that led Jesus to, to the cross was that he was too inclusive, you know, he included a lot of people around him, I would feel comfortable at his table as, and he would make sure everyone would feel comfortable at his table. Um, and I, re I read another story that was really fascinating from your book about Mother Mary Lang. Uh, and it seems that when we speak about um, black saints, People, oh, uh, Josefina Bequita. So, well, uh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Josefina is, is, is a saint. But it's not the only saint with a dark skin tone, you know? And, uh, oh, my God, how can we how can we narrow it to a saint? Only one. When we have thousands and thousands of people from different colors, different cultural backgrounds. So when I speak about an African saint, or an African descendant saint, don't tell me that it's Bakita because there are hundreds of them. And thank God on many of them on path, on the formal process of being recognized saints. And you speak about a lot of them in your book. But I read the story of Mother Lang. I don't know if we can, if we can speak about her. And I felt, okay, Mother Mary Lang is a tough woman as well. <laughs> so I need to paint her, but I will let you uh, tell the story. <laughs> well, and, I, you know, Ruben, I, I always joke that most saint books are 45 white people and Martin de Porres. Um, <laughs> and I, I think sometimes it's 45 white people and Josephine Bakita. And yes, Bakita yes. has an amazing story. But really at the heart of her story is this question of... Um, black forgiveness of white torture, right? And you you can't ignore that part of her story, but if she's the only story of black holiness that you're telling, yeah. Yeah. then it sounds like what it is to be holy and black is to forgive pe white people their atrocities. And yeah. that's problematic yeah. if that's the way that we're distilling that. And Martin de Porres comes out the same way too, right? Yes. Because his whole right. life is about forgiving the terrible things that white people were doing, for him, doing to him. And that has to be a part of their stories. 
but then we have to tell other stories of black holiness because yeah. if we don't, it, it's so reductive, right? And so to have the Ugandan martyrs who, whose stories really interact very little with white people or to have Blessed Benedict uh, Daswa or to have Victoire Rizou Manarivo or to have Mother Mary Lang, um, who was never enslaved. Uh, and, you know, she was born a free woman in the Caribbean and she moved up to Maryland. She was a very wealthy woman um, and she moved to Maryland and used her wealth and her privilege to educate uh, poor enslaved or formerly enslaved black children. Um, and it, And she moved from a place where she she had a degree of privilege and freedom and she moved to Maryland, which was a slave state. Um, and it, and she was living there before the civil war and willingly took on the, uh, the suffering that, that she didn't have to experience by nature, right? Like moved to a place where she knew it was going to be harder for her because that was where she was going to be able to serve the best. And she founded a religious order that still exists today. I went to, visit her body with my nephew recently and there was a sister there who had been a sister for 78 years wow. i was like <laughs> amazing oh my, i was like oh my gosh even if you entered when you were 16 you're like coming up on 100 now like yeah. dang my nephew was like how long had she done that and i was like i know peter that's like maybe it was 68 but it was a long it was a long long time yeah. um, so these sisters are still out there, they're still doing this work. And obviously there was all kinds of prejudice that they were dealing with, but Mother Mother Lang was just like, look, these are these are God's children and I'm gonna serve them and I'm gonna work for them. And like the bishop is gonna be racist and like he can do what he's gotta do, right? Like this is not, this is not my problem. I don't have to fix him. I don't have to educate him. Like it's not my job to convert this this bishop, right? My job is to do the work that God has put before me. And and to found this order and to serve these children. And she built all of these schools, many of which still exist today. I mean, there's this whole like, thousands and thousands of educated black Catholics who, who can trace that back to the work of Mary Lang um, and the service that her sisters provided. So she's, she's such a beautiful one when you are trying to work within the system of the church and dealing with opposition from people in power, trying to, to walk that line of like, well, I wanna honor the bishop's authority. And I also wanna do what I know to be right. And I wanna be faithful to God's call, but I also wanna be a Catholic, which means following the rules that are set for me. Um, and that can be, a really, it can be a really tricky thing to do when you're trying to do justice work and trying to be profoundly faithful to what the church teaches. And so Mother Mary Lang is a great one for that. And I love those children surrounding yes. her, right? And this idea of just their excitement, right? Like of the inclusion that she made possible for them because yep. she was doing what was honestly dangerous, like physically dangerous to be teaching black children to read at the time. Mm -hmm. And yep. she was like, but this is what God has asked me to do. Yeah, segregation was was in place uh, back then. So it was really harsh for her. But I love the fact that she wanted to become a nun. And because there were no religious orders that would accept her, a black nun, she said, OK, fine, I will create my own. <laughs> and she did. Uh, and uh, she was do doing this not for prestige, not for not for, not even for fame, nothing. It was because she believed that she had a place in the church. She believed in that call. Um, and even when it was the cholera epidemic, uh, that she was working alongside the white nuns, uh, the white nuns and the white religious orders, they received a lot of praise back then for the work they did for the cholera and uh, Mother Mary Lang and her sisters received none recognition for the work they did. Uh, but it didn't stop her. So I think this is a great example for people that feel hurt by the church as well. Uh, you know, after we do a lot of work, people are just this. And I hear these stories. Some Sometimes people are in the parish working there for, I don't know, so many years. And then a new priest comes and send them away. Uh, and people really feel feel hurt with the church sometimes. But we have to think that we are not going to the church because the work we do there or because of the priest or because of the building. We go there because of that personal loving relationship you just mentioned on the life of Peter Kibe. We go there because we love God. Everything else will help that relationship or should help that relationship, but it's not the goal. So as the saints are not the goal, the buildings, whatever we do in the church or the priests, they are not the goal. And I think all these lives tell us to go 
a little bit further or to focus on what the goal is. Yes, exactly. Think, yeah, and and some people said, oh, you did Mother Mary Lang in a very serious semblance because usually I portray the saints smiling or a little bit more uplifting. But I felt it wasn't right to do Mother Mary Lang like that because she had to endure these hardships. You know, she was a very strong-minded. She was very focused on the goal. Uh, she was doing this with her own personal suffering, fighting prejudice in, in during segregation. So that was hard. So no way I would put her smiling, you know. So I, I wanted to portray her determined. I think that's well, the, the expression. And I think the, the feeling that you get looking at her is her standing between these children and whatever's coming for them. You know, oh. like it's not, she's not making that face at the children. She's making <laughs> that face at the people who want to push the children down. And she's like, yeah. look, if you want to oppress these children, you're going to have to come through me. <laughs> right? Like, yes, I think that's amazing. Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm just noticing the time, but I think that because we are doing this online, and people are at home they are comfortable i think we can we can we can continue com talking a bit more i feel that i can speak with you until until dawn but <laughs> let's not do that but we can speak a little bit more uh can we talk about the nativity painting yes yes I, I will go to the nativity painting in a minute okay. now, because you said something different you saw something different in this painting that i haven't seen it before so that feeling that you feel that mother mary lang is kind of in a way protecting the children uh, it happens a lot of times for me when I do certain paintings that people see in them something I don't necessarily see. And that's another beauty of art. Art doesn't belong to a specific person. You don't need to have specific degrees to, to know how to enjoy art or to understand art. Art is what it is, and it's for everyone. Uh, and uh, it happened a bit with these paintings. I'm sharing here Therese of Lisieux. We already spoke about Therese of Lisieux. I wanted to paint Therese in a different way. As you said, um, uh, the church sometimes tries to oversell the saints and not in a good way. So the early images I have of Therese, they are very, um, yeah, uh, sugar-coated, you know, that if yeah. just by looking at it, you will have diabetes, you know? It's all the flowers, all the fluffs and all the beautiful blue eyes. And I feel that sometimes it's like you say, when they tell us the story of a saint, oh, she was so pure when she was born. She was drawn to prayer and charity by five years old. Then she went to the monastery and then she died and went to heaven. So mm -hmm. well, for her or for him, you know, but that doesn't tell me anything. That doesn't add anything to my life. So we don't relate. If you don't relate to these people, to these stories, how can they change your hearts? And I think a lot of damage is done to the figure of Therese because of this because she was really uh, a, a very tough person as well, you know, and she struggled with, the with her faith. So when I did this painting, I was having um, uh, some doubts. I was struggling with my own faith. And thank God, uh, because faith is about questioning, it's about growing. When we think that we are already believers forever, uh, we are not questioning our faith, so we are not growing. So I remember going through some dark period of my life uh, when I had my doubts, but Therese held my hand and told me, you know what, I struggled with that as well. By the time I was really sick, uh, dying, I doubted that God existed. So, you know, I was reading her biographies and the biographer was really honest about it. And so, oh, thank God, because now I can relate with Therese because I'm going through the same. So I did this painting to show a less pink <laughs> sugar-coated image of Therese, where uh, portraying the, the time of her life that also God seemed dead to her. And it's part of the name she took for herself, you know. She's Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face. So she's kind of consoling uh, Jesus as well in the painting. Um, this is me trying to bring humanity, not just to new saints or to unknown saints, but also to the, names, to the saints that are already very famous. For example, Dominic. Um, Dominic, on the other side, with a big smile. This was a painting commissioned to me. It's uh, in New Hampshire, in the United States. It was commissioned to a church there. Uh, you seem, you, you take all my paintings, Meg. They are all in the United States. <laughs> thank God, thank God. Um, but it was commissioned. Uh, they wanted the painting of Dominic. And when I, do, when I did the research about who Dominic was, I wasn't very familiar with Dominic. I asked a few Dominican brothers I know 
uh, here in London, you know them as well from the Priory. Uh, and they start sharing, both brothers and sisters, Dominican sisters, that Dominic was funny. Dominic was actually a funny person, uh, always telling a joke, laughing a lot. So no way. If you Google Dominic, Saint Dominic on, on, on Google, and I challenge you to do that now, whoever is watching, you won't see a single picture of Dominic with a smile. He's grumpy <laughs> with the longest face. And oh my God, what good is this, is this doing to Dominic or even to evangelization? Because if you want to show Dominic to young people or to people that don't have faith, well, people won't engage with that. You won't go to a church where you have a boring person speaking to you. You know, you won't follow someone that is boring. That's why Jesus himself was a funny person. You know, he used to tell stories to captivate his audience. And sometimes we forget that. He wouldn't have the amount of followers he had if he was a grumpy guy. You know, renounce everything and follow me because I'm grumpy. Oh my God, I'm already renouncing everything. If I'm going to follow someone that is always upset, I wouldn't follow him. I said, oh, fine, this is not for me. I'm going back home. So he, he, he used to captivate people. So Dominic was the same. He used to, that's why he was such a good preacher. You know, again, the seriousness doesn't do any good when you try to touch the hearts of people. So Dominic knew exactly that. So I painted Dominic with a big smile and the, the repercussion that that had was amazing. People really engaged with this painting. And then one of the most famous ones is the Doubting Thomas in the Middle. And I did this painting, you know, just one day. I thought, oh, it would be fun to paint Thomas like this. And uh, uh, Father James Martin saw the painting on Twitter and he tweeted. And after that, well, this painting became famous for both reasons, good and bad, because he had a lot of criticism as well. But that's fine. It's part of the process anyway. If it's unsettling people, art is already doing its role. You know, so if it's upsetting you, it's already interfering with you. So therefore, we are going somewhere with this. <laughs> and people do struggle to, to see humanity in sacred art because, again, they put God in a box very distant and very away from their lives. So he won't interfere with their hearts. Uh, and when something like this comes up, people feel like, oh, my God, this is this is agitating the waters. But sometimes we do have to agitate the waters. To, to get somewhere so people reacted mostly positively to this painting and they still do it's one of the prints that i'm it's yeah that i sell the most it's, it's thomas and uh, thomas if yeah, i always ask people especially the ones that were upset uh if a friend a dear friend of yours was killed in the most tremendous way and would come back to life and appeared in front of you after you seen him dead wouldn't this be your expression wouldn't this be your face? So if it was, why wouldn't it be Thomas? Thomas is one of is one apostle. He is, he is a human being. And the problem is when we go to churches and we see paintings of the risen Christ or stained glasses, usually Jesus is like this. You know? And all the apostles are like, oh great, he came back. You know, so <laughs> where is the human humanity of it? If God dialogues with us through humanity and that's why he was born uh, uh why would we sh show away the or send away the saints and god to a different path that is not human you know it's it seems that we are doing it on purpose not to have a relationship with them and some and and i realized when i did this painting that uh, and i ask you meg where is the reason christ in in thomas painting i mean he's yeah. where i am right yeah, exactly. It's where you are. It's in your heart. Mm. So the reason Christ is with you, it's in you. So he's seeing the Jesus that is in you, in your heart, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's astonishing to me. And, and I know the internet, so I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. But it's astonishing to me that people took offense at this because I looked at that. This was the first image of yours that I saw. And I have spent so much time praying with John 20 and so much time meditating on St. Thomas. And I had... I had frequently, you know, imagined Jesus coming and Thomas being sort of like ashamed at the mm -hmm. doubt that he had experienced. I'd imagine Thomas being like pleased, but also afraid. You know, there's that like stick your fingers in my hands that I'd, I'd prayed about it in so many different ways before. And this was the first time that I was like, oh, my gosh, like maybe everything just like dropped away. And he wasn't he wasn't ashamed. And he like there was no recrimination. It was just like. 
oh, holy wow. Like you yeah. really did it. You really, you really did it. Um, and I think, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. That just that delight. Yeah. Right. Like that, the, the astonishment and the delight. And I think that's so much a part of my experience of who Jesus is, right? Like not just astonishment and delight at his presence in my life, but at the things that he's doing and at the way, especially like I have, the Lord works a lot in my life by making things go very wrong, um, <laughs> sometimes in very dramatic <laughs> ways. And I, my reaction tends to be like, the sky is falling. Uh, yeah. And then, and then he does something and I make that face and I'm like, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> oh, man. you know, um, and I think it's such a, such a healthy spiritual approach to try to react to God's work with that astonishment, as opposed to sort of a, a, a formality of gratitude, right? Like we, we're we sort of trained to say good and gracious God, we praise and right. reverence you for these thy gifts, which, you know, and like, instead to be like, dang, shoot, like, no, you didn't, <laughs> Jesus, like, no, you didn't. And uh, and that's that image for me. And I think that's, <laughs> that's wonder and awe, you know, like, that's, that's the real fear of the Lord that the yes. gifts of the Holy Spirit talk about is this like, what the heck, right? Yes. <laughs> because joy doesn't take any reverence. Mm -hmm. You can be very joyful with your friends and still respect them deeply, you know, and you will still hug them. You will still high five them. You will still have honest conversations with them. That doesn't take any of the respect of it. And I think that when we take formality into sacred art and liturgy, well, yeah, I understand in liturgies we have the, but you understand it's the way people re relate to one another. If there is a lot of formality, you are uh, uh, obviously putting God away from your life when he made all the effort to come and live with us. And I'm going to show the nativity now because it always moves me because I, f I feel that if I was God, if I was Jesus, the last place I would want to be born was on earth, is on earth, isn't it? <laughs> and he came, he came, he came to be with us. He came, um, he didn't shy away. He doesn't shy away from us. And here he is humble without any titles, without any prestige, just for every and every single one of us could feel comfortable approaching him, you know, because he's not a king, he's not a mayor, he's not a wealthy person, he's just one of us. Bring him to our homes this Christmas. I think that's the biggest. But I, 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 I'm going to allow you to speak now. <laughs> I mean, just like Advent for me every year is just this image of snuggling baby Jesus, right? And like, and Christmas too. But I think because in Advent, it's impossible for my mind to be anywhere but on the manger. It's always this anticipatory like, and, and I lead children through these meditations and I'm like, okay, and now Mary puts baby Jesus in your arms and what do you do? And they say, I kiss him, right? And, you know, just this, like, this image of drawing so close to Jesus. And the, there was one day years and years ago, it was uh, midnight mass and I was there by myself um, and I go up to communion and as right after I received communion and as I'm about to step away, I hear the priest whisper, come closer to me. And he was talking to the altar server who wasn't close enough with the patent. But like what happened is I came to Jesus at Christmas and received the Christ child. And he spoke to me in persona Christi and said, come closer to me. And just that meditation on how the whole purpose of the incarnation is to make it possible for us to draw near to Jesus in this radical, astonishing way. You know, when we look at Mary and Joseph in this image and we think about how close they are to Jesus and, and we recognize that you and I, every time we receive communion, are closer even than that. Yeah. Right? That the, the humility of our God is so profound that it wasn't enough for him to become a helpless baby. He became an inanimate host, yeah. pathetic and subject to all of the whims and revilings of the world for the rest of time. You know, and I always, I always think about this with St. Joseph and the Eucharist, that that we are closer to Jesus in the Eucharist than St. Joseph ever was. Yeah. And to think how Joseph delighted in Jesus, that's such an invitation to me to say, like, can you 
can you delight in Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament in this way? And to look at how Mary would have been desperate to be close to him. It's that invitation. Can I be desperate to be close to Jesus in that way? There's an image in a stained glass window in a church in Kentucky that's Mary holding a six-month-old Jesus. And she's she's holding his finger like this, and she's just staring at his finger. And I froze in front of that image. And it was really, I think, the first time that I understood why I needed Mary in my life is that I can I can comprehend what it is for a mother to worship her baby. And if I can imagine Mary worshiping Jesus like that, then I know what it looks like for me to worship Jesus, right? Like she's she's the model of believers and that and profoundly because of the delight she found in him as an infant. Uh, and so I think ever since then, when I see an image like this, where Mary isn't just like a holder of baby Jesus, but <laughs> but a, a mother who snuggles and nuzzles and, and delights and just like stares at his tiny little baby eyelashes and like looks at the dimples in his tiny little baby fingers. And I think that's the call of the Christian life yeah. is to fix our eyes so firmly on Jesus that we can't help but be awestruck at the wonder of who he is as the Christ child, as Jesus, the six-year-old playing in the mud, as Jesus at 32 with the smile lines around his eyes, as Jesus in the blessed sacrament, waiting yes. for me, longing for me just as much as he did for his mother in the manger. Uh, and so I think for me, this, this image um, is such a gift during this time of Advent and during the Christmas season as that invitation to say, like, you don't have to feel the feelings. Like, you can't manufacture that in yourself. But can you choose to draw near to Jesus in the way that Mary and Joseph did? Can you can you make the motion physically, even if you can't move your heart to feel those feelings? Can you say, like, I'm going to come closer to him and I'm going to welcome him into my heart as the Christ child? It's it's beyond any words, isn't it? It's so beautiful. And we have so many saints that teach us exactly that, to look into, into the hidden life of Jesus. Uh, Charles Foucault was one of them. Uh, he dedicated his life in the desert, uh, you know, to the Tuareg people in the hidden life. And he was devoted of the hidden life of Jesus. And uh, uh, that's so beautiful because quite often we forget the daily chores that they had to do. You know, he had to work. He worked as as a man. He, he was he was a teenager. So if there are any teenagers or young people on on this life call, he was exactly like you. He struggled like you struggle today. He had the same, you know, growing issues that we all face. And he went through all that. And he's, he was not. He didn't appear just okay. I'm here <laughs> saying a few stuff, going there, dying in the cross. I will come back in a minute. So no, no, no. It was much more than that. Again we have to bring things that people can relate to so they can feel that the saints are part or the saints and God is part of our lives, our daily lives, even when washing the dishes, isn't it? <laughs> or vacuum the house or any, or commuting to work. Uh, perhaps if we imagine Jesus next to us while driving, we will swear less. <laughs> uh <laughs> my favorite line from Charles Fuku, and then maybe we can open it up to, if anybody has any questions um, that you want to oh, yeah. share in the chat on Facebook. My favorite line from Charles Fuku, he said, "Oh, and then look at his eyes." <laughs> Charles Fuku is such a gift. the The reason that I love him is that I saw a picture of him and was like, "That guy is my friend." Like, he loves me with the love of Jesus. And I began to research his story, and I was like, "Wow, we really have the same story in a lot of ways." Um, but he has this line. He said that he wanted to live in such a way that people would look at him and say, if such is the servant, what must the master be? Hmm. And I, I mean, aside from what's written in scripture, I think it's my favorite thing a saint has ever said. Yep. He wants to live in such a way that people look at him and say, if such is the servant, what must the master be? And it was just this like radical self-emptying love, right? He wasn't, he wasn't, proselytizing. He wasn't even preaching. He just loved people. He looked at them like they mattered. And he was a massive failure in any measure that the world would offer. Yes. Uh, but but he was a radical success because he loved well. And ultimately, that's our call, right? God isn't calling us to be brilliant, 
to be successful, to accomplish great things, to have deeply faithful children. Like all of those things are wonderful, but ultimately the call is to love well. And Charles de Foucault, he loved well. And after his death, it changed the world. But in his life, he had to be content in saying, well, God has just asked me to be here and love these people. And so that's what I'm going to do. Yes, that's exactly it. When I read his life and I found that he didn't accomplish any great things, I was kind of disappointed. I said, oh, my God, he's so famous. And he didn't even have any followers. He didn't even found an order. I was really impressed by that. Uh, but again, it's not the works of God. It's God that matters. It's not what we can accomplish. It's God. God is God. And sometimes we we replace him by all these things that we want to achieve and all these things that we want uh, to build. And now we have to have the goal uh, in God alone. I did in the painting in the background, I did Mary and Joseph fleeing to the Egypt. So yeah. it's a reference to the hidden life of Christ that Charles dedicated his life to. Um, so that's why it's that stage in life that Jesus, we stop hearing from Jesus when after he's born, after 12 years old, then we stop hearing him until he comes public. That was the hidden life of, of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, but we would love if some people, if people are watching us, uh, and I know they are, if you want to make any questions, please feel feel free to do it. I hope you are not asleep. I don't think we are boring speakers at all. <laughs> but yes, go for it and don't be shy about making questions. Um, and while we wait to see if someone will will say something, uh, there is something I would like um, to to ask you as well, and I think it's very um, it's very timely. So there is more and more talks about mental health. Uh, mental health is really something people should be open, should feel safe to speak about it. And uh, there is a lot of taboo around uh, mental health. And after COVID, and, you know, I work in a hospital as well, uh, managing conflict and helping staff um, when they need to be here. And uh, if they have concerns to escalate, I try to promote a safe route for them, confidential route to them, for them to raise their concerns. Um, and more and more, we speak about mental health. I did therapy. It was provided through the hospital to their workers. And I'm very grateful for that experience. It really helped me to be a better person. Uh, but when I looked around, I said, well, okay, I may be the only one because no one in heaven struggles with mental health. Otherwise, they wouldn't be saints. And again, in your book, <laughs> here in your book, you explain that this is not just uh, part of our lives. If It's part of the saints as well. And some saints struggle with mental, uh, mental health issues. And there is one thing that you say that is remarkable. Uh, and I think it's the key for understanding saints in our spiritual lives. Uh, we don't know uh, how Jesus was well we don't know how holiness looks like through looking at jesus if you have mental health because it's not known that jesus had mental health but perhaps oscar romero uh, had uh, mental health problems and we know how holiness looks like in the life of oscar romero or even rutilio grande you know uh, would you like to speak a bit uh, about that Meg? Sorry absolutely <laughs> oh my gosh put me on the spot um yeah it's beautiful i had someone message me the other day and she was like hey do you have any saints who struggle with mental illness and i knew that this woman had my book and so i like sent her an article that i had written but then i was like also you can go in, and she was asking about chronic illness and mental illness and i was like you can go in the index and you can look up illness and you can find chronic illness and mental illness and acute illness um and i think Again, yeah, it's something that I think, especially in Christian circles, has been very taboo because there's this this feeling that if you're dealing with mental illness, it's because you don't pray enough, right? Yeah. Or because you know you're despairing because you don't trust God, or um, the the language that we use in talking about suicide, right? There's just like so much toxic stuff there, um, and I think you can look at a lot of the lives of the saints, and you can try to diagnose them, you know, like. Blessed Eustochium of Padua, like for sure had borderline personality disorder, mm -hmm. for sure. But also she's in the 15th century. So like, I can't technically make that diagnosis. But these two have actual diagnoses, right? Mm -hmm. Like these two, you've got Rutilio Grande um, on the left with the Roman collar and Oscar Romero in Rubens painting on the right. Uh, Oscar Romero had diagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder. Like this is not I think probably that's what's going on. Like he yeah. had an actual diagnosis. And Rutilio Grande was multiple times hospitalized with catatonic schizophrenia. 
right? Like this is not, you know, this isn't like we're guessing. This isn't even something mild, right? This is a very, very serious. He was, he was multiple times unable to speak, to make eye contact, to respond to any outside stimuli, probably because of anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder, but I haven't been able to find the paperwork on that. So again, this is my diagnosis, but the catatonic schizophrenia is an actual doctor's diagnosis who met him and knew him in real life. Um, and to see to see these two, or to see Blessed Basil Hopko, who was a Slovakian Catholic bishop, whose struggle with mental illness was so severe that he was released from a communist prison camp so that he could get mental help. Like, Ruben, you got to be really far gone if communist prison guards feel bad for you, right? Yes. Like, <laughs> and, and they were like, buddy, you are not okay. We're going to send you to the hospital, right? And, that, and it was a, a problem for him for years. And I think when we look at these saints where it's not, it's not just like, oh, back before they knew Jesus, they struggled. And then Jesus came and everything was sunshine and butterflies. But like, here are incredibly faithful people who loved the Lord and who were have been canonized for a life that included persistent mental illness till the end of their lives, right? Looking at St. Mark Ji Tianxiang with his uh, addiction to opium or yeah. Venerable Matt Talbot with his alcoholism. Um, you know, all of these different saints and to see to see their lives, to see Dorothy Day with her multiple suicide attempts, right? Yeah. Ignatius Loyola after his conversion dealt with suicidal ideations. Therese yeah. dealt with suicidal yeah. ideations. Don't put that on the internet because people will come for you. But you know, like it's because people don't realize that it is not a moral failing to deal yeah. with mental illness, right? No. And when you see these saints and you see that this is not the before of their journey to holiness, but this is what their journey to holiness looked like is depression for decades and suicidal ideations. And Venerable Francis Lieberman, every time he crossed a bridge, had to like grit his teeth because it was a temptation to throw himself off. You know, and that's not something that the Lord healed him of once he had a real conversion. Like this is decades while he was serving the Lord and serving the church. Uh, and I think just the encouragement of knowing that like sometimes these saints are released of their mental illness. Like sometimes there is a healing and sometimes there's not, but it's not because Jesus wasn't with them. It's not because he didn't love them. It's not because they were a disappointment to him. It's because we live in a broken world and we are fallen people and that manifests itself in a lot of really ugly things that God works through, that God can transform, that God can glorify even when he doesn't heal it. Yes. Uh, and the the fact that this is really important is we have a few people saying that this is important to speak about mental health open because, again, it doesn't need to be a taboo and we don't need to shy this away and we need to bring it to the light of God and we need to speak about it. Even priests, you know, priests, religious people, consecrated people, uh, it's that fact that you have to be there for others, but who is there for you? Who is there to support you as a priest? Uh, you know, uh, you need to, to speak about whatever you are going through and what you are facing. Even if it's doubts about your faith, if it's doubts about your vocation, you should feel that you have a safe space to speak about it. And that doesn't take away anything uh, from from you being a priest or being a bishop or, <laughs> you know, or you being a Catholic in general. It's really part, uh, I think it, it's one of the things that only increases mental health problems is that we don't speak about them. And we just ignore them, you know, uh, and we think that we are weak if we speak about what we are going through. And uh, uh, isn't St. Paul that says it is in their we is weakness that this is the strength of Jesus? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's change this to feel the strength of the, uh, Jesus also through our, uh, uh, our mental health as well or anything in our life in general. There is one. F uh, we don't have any questions. So it seems oh, that we have one from Chica. Oh, okay. So go, uh, you, if you can see it. <laughs> yeah. Chica says, Ruben, how do you come up with the facial features, tones, details, etc., of saints of whom you do not have an actual image? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, well, painting is not a photography, okay? Um, so, and, and, and thank God for that, because it helps me to create a narrative uh, when you see the painting of Sarah that we just spoke of, I could create that. It wasn't a photography, but it came from the narrative of her life and what we know about her. And we have photos of Sarah, so that was uh, easier to, to paint. Um, so because it's not a photo, 
a painting, a process of a painting is not something immediate. It requires prayer, it requires a lot of work in the background. So what people see in the end is just the tip of the pyramid. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, underneath things from sending canvases, preparing canvases, preparing sketches, searching for images, gathering inspiration, reading, 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 and praying even more to try to build up an image of what the person may be uh, look like. Uh, when we have photos of them, uh, perfect, fine. When we don't have, then uh, I try to understand through their lives um, if they were, if they look determined. For example, Peter Kibe, we don't know photos of him, but I know he was a very determined man. Um, uh, someone said, it was you, Meg, that he was the most determined man on earth. <laughs> so I felt that I had to paint him in a very determined expression. So in the end, it doesn't really matter if Peter Kibe looked exactly like I, like I painted him. It matters if it's able to tell a story. If it, it matters if it's able to generate a conversation. Uh, you know, and I think that's what we can bring, what I can bring to saints that don't have photos or they have very old representations. If I can do them in a way that generate a talk, it generates a dialogue. When people come and visit my studio, they are strike for people that then don't look like saints. I'm just doing uh, Paul Tiang Xiang, if I spelled it right, <laughs> just in the back there. No, here. <laughs> He's from Laos. I also read his story from the book uh, of Meg. And he doesn't look as a conventional saint because he's with his native uh, costume from Laos. And we are not used to see people from, you know, wearing clothes that are not habits <laughs> or cassocks in paintings. So I did him with a lot of color because, yeah, it's part of who he was. And uh, the amount of people that when I do video calls uh, that see him in the background or people that come into the house and they ask, oh, who is that guy that you are painting? That's the purpose of art, generating a conversation. It opens a window for me to tell his story and hopefully leading people to a closer relationship to God. So sometimes it's not about how they look, but how can I tell a story through the painting? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and I should share also. So I've got um, also this children's book called mm -hmm. Saints Around the World. And so with Lindsay, who is one of my best friends, who was doing the art for this, um, you know, I, I was able to see a lot of her process. Um, you know, you've got Jacinta. That's a very typical depiction. It's not super complicated. And Josephine, she's got beautiful images there. But, you know, we know what Josephine Bakita looked like. Um, but I look at... For example, Blessed Columba Kangwon Suk, who is um, a favorite of mine. And Lindsay, in drawing this picture, she said, you know, I wanted to look at what a Korean facial features look like and what um, the bone structure looks like and what the clothing looks like. But she said, I also looked up how do Korean women stand when they are in a defensive posture? And mm -hmm. I was like, it just never would have occurred to me, you know, and once she said that, I'm like, well, of course, you know, as an American woman, I'd stand like this, but you would, <laughs> you would never expect that no, in no, East no. Asia, right? Like at the hip pop that like makes me look tough in America would look very <laughs> silly in other, in other cultures. And so she found images of the Korean comfort women who were the women who were impressed into prostitution. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they stand with their arms at their sides like this. And so that's sort of an image of I'm in an impossible situation and I'm choosing to be strong, even though there's nothing that I can really do to protect the people that I love, right? Like, and so um, just watching her do that research and, and make those connections was really fascinating for me, right? Like not, not just the surface level where I was like, oh, well, what does a Thai person look like? Because she was like, oh, but you also have to ask, like, you know, how does a Chinese person hold his hand when he's, or his hands when he's greeting you, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah because it's like not going to be a handshake, is it? Right. Um, and so it's really beautiful. I think when you've got artists who have their finger on the pulse of these cultural differences. And I think that you really do, Ruben, that in, in being able to look at these people and say, not just how do I think this person might have looked, but like, what would it mean to give that impression in this cultural context. Um, yes. So thank you for your question, Chica. Yes, <laughs> thank and you, I that's think, exactly it, yeah. 
<laughs> all right. Well, I think that's all the questions we've got, which is great because I haven't eaten dinner yet. So I'm pretty psyched yes. to go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Meg, for being with us, being with me. It was a true pleasure. Uh, thank you for everyone that watched. Uh, it's the 14th of December, so you are still in time to buy uh, Meg's book. And I'm not earning any money from making publicity. <laughs> We should, really we should get you a commission on this, Ruben. I think so, I think so. <laughs> and you can also order Ruben's prints, and you they yes. are suitable for framing for your family. And also, uh, how big can they get? Can churches order these and, like, put them up in their yes. churches? Yes, I, can, I can always consider doing a, a bigger size. Yeah, that's Okay. That's like Carla so, Cutis, for example. People order a lot of Carla Cutis, and now I'm going to send to his mom one of the prints because she saw the painting and she loved it. So she wanted to, uh, you know, know a little bit more about the painting. And I'm so grateful um, that she will be able to have a painting that I did of her son. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just amazing. But oh yes, gosh, this I'm is how the God of Surprises keeps surprising us and showing that we are on the right path. So yeah, wow. God of Surprises keeps surprising. <laughs> yes. So especially if you maybe go to Mass this Sunday and you look around your church and you notice that it is 45 white people and Martin de Porres, Um <laughs> You have some options in the work of one Mr. Ruben Ferreira who can help yes. you just to, to help the members of your congregation see themselves depicted, uh, see what holiness looks like with their facial features, and to help other people who maybe have only ever seen themselves to recognize that holiness is much broader than the Irish and Italian that we're yeah. used to in our stained glass windows. That's so true. And diversity is something to be celebrated. It's one of the biggest treasures that church has. And with this, uh, I wish everyone a great Christmas. And again, all the blessings for you. Mag, keep us surprising us with my amazing lives of saints. Do follow uh, Mag on Twitter. She keeps sharing stories and stories. I have to stop following you because I keep thinking about more and more paintings that I don't have time to do. So keep me in your prayers so I would have more time <laughs> to paint, <laughs> to make your you make your saints come alive as well through my art. And thank you so much for all the gifts you put to the service of the church and the world. I'm deeply grateful. And to everyone that took time to watch us, uh, all the blessings to you as well. Uh, God bless you and strive for holiness because, again, there is nothing in your life that God won't use to make you holy. Amen. So, Praise yes. God. Merry Christmas, friends. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.